Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome. Uh, again, I think everybody knows me. I'm Stuart, Stuart Gray, the coach of officer for Spartans Youth Section. We might have some sort of parents join us from the, the younger age groups as well. So a little bit of housekeeping first and foremost. Uh, we can just ask everybody to put themselves on mute. You can use the sort of chat function if you get any questions uh, as we're going on on the presentations. Uh, put them into the chat and Carol and I'll keep uh, a look on that as well. And after the presentation, Pete, we're hopefully going to open up to a question uh, and answers. So another Spartans boot room, I think it's the fifth in the series. Obviously, uh, the corona has taken an effect as being on the, the pitch with the kids. So I think in the last couple of weeks, everybody probably happy to get the kids back to school. And certainly I think the coaches have I've been delighted as the kids have been to get them back onto the football field as well and playing games. So Monday night there, that was our 11 asides, so our, our under 13s were doing non-contact. So I was up, up at the academy and Monday night was fantastic just watching them uh, playing the small games. <clears throat> so tonight I'm actually delighted uh, to introduce you to Pete Sturgis. So Pete is the English FA Foundation lead coach and that's the five to 11 year olds. He's been described as the genius behind the English Foundation face DNA in the long-term player development. So I think a lot to live up to with that, uh, Pete. Uh, during this session, Pete's going to share some of his knowledge and experience in skill development and what it looks like in the foundation phase. In his role uh, as the lead coach for English FA, Pete has been charged with creating and rolling out a coaching blueprint that will affect every child who wants to play the game in England. His plan is for five to 11 year olds to implement in schools and grassroots clubs and in conjunction with the professional academies. Pete believes the five to 11 year old range is a magical period in a child's life when players are really open to learning and opening their creativity. I've been following Pete for probably two years on YouTube and uh, on the Twitter and some of you know, his deliveries, how he interacts with, with the young people is actually fantastic. I think uh, pre-corona, I think three or four of the SFA development coaches actually drove out four hours down uh, to watch Pete as well. So I think we're all in for a fantastic night and hopefully it will open up some, some lively debate. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over uh, to Pete. Thanks, Stuart. I feel really nervous now, guys, after that introduction. <laughs> I've never been called a genius before. Um, but I, I really, I mean, I'm very open to these kind of sessions. My job takes me across all levels of the game. Um, I don't want to spend all my time with the coaches in the professional academies because I think the magic begins in grassroots because all the kids that the academies get start in grassroots. So I firmly believe that if we can, if we can build a relationship with the, the volunteers, the parents, and, and the part-time coaches who get the kids first in that foundation phase, then we've got a real chance to improve things really quickly and to establish some, some really great um, minimum operating standards for, for which we can develop the kids. So um, I love doing these events. I haven't got many slides. I'd like it to be a little bit of me and then more of you you guys just you know asking the questions nothing's off limits um i'm happy to be as honest as i can because this will be you know my opinions based on on the experiences that i've had i have to point out that i i haven't got the answer to everything um but i think i've probably experienced a lot of what you guys go through on a weekly basis um I'm still very active as a coach, so I, I, I don't want to be someone who sits behind a desk and tells people how to do it. I actually want to say, let's get my hands dirty, let's work with kids, and then let's see if a lot of the ideas that I have actually work with the kids. So for me, it's as much of a testing ground as well. Um, and then from that, we can establish some really clear messages for the whole game. So. Um, Thanks for the invite. I'm going to share the screen now. And as I say, I haven't got um, many slides, but um, let's see where we go. <clears throat> I want to start with a quote. And um, I think we've all got 
teams that we enjoy watching playing and and I'm a I'm a Walsall supporter so we really don't get much success and we go from hard times to even harder times so but they're my team and I love them but one of the teams I really like to watch playing is is Arsenal particularly when this guy was in charge and his ideas around developing young players really resonate with my own ideas because it's about technical excellence it's about creativity it's about using your imagination and really honing those decision making skills so this was almost the bedrock of where we wanted to go in the, in England i've been part of a player insights group for the last 18 months and we've been looking at what is our what is our aim across all of our development and what we want to do is three things the first main priority is that we want to develop more skillful players now it, it might sound a, a, you know quite a bland statement but it, we have to increase the skill levels across the game particularly if we as a nation want to do well in uh, fifa and ua for competitions you have to have really high levels of skill that doesn't start when gareth southgate or ady boothroyd gets the players it starts right at the beginning of their journey and we're trying to look at each player as having their own individual skills journey so that we begin to meet their individual needs at every point of development and so whatever they're capable of doing and whatever their potential is we want to help them become the most skillful version of themselves that they can be so that's the first thing developing more skillful players we want to provide some inspirational opportunities the game in england particularly in the um, well no it's at all levels you may only play one format of the game so for a season for two seasons you might just play 5v5 or 7v7 for what we want to enlighten coaches with is that if you want to develop skill it has to be done using lots of different formats of the game and it has to be used providing lots of different opportunities during those formative years that really develop the kind of skills and the the kind of players that when they do specialize in 11v11 later on what they're taking with them is so much more because of the variety the formats the different experiences and opportunities that we've provided for them so we've got skillful players inspirational opportunities and then we're looking at the role of the coach because a great coach can really open up all these possibilities and open up kids creativity and imagination but they can also shut it down and we're already finding that kids as young as 6 are losing the capability and the capacity to be creative and i don't want to blame schools but i know in england the schools are it's becoming more about passing the test rather than introducing the kids to the joy of learning I think in football we have to introduce kids to the joy of playing becoming better becoming more skillful and then staying as a long time participant in the game for the rest of your life so skillful players inspirational opportunities and then exceptional coaches or coaches who really do understand how to provide the right opportunities to develop those skillful players Blimey, that's only the first slide, guys. Sorry. Is everybody okay with that? Just give me a thumbs up. Yeah. What was really encouraging that when uh, Stuart sent me a couple of presentations about Spartans, I was looking through it and thinking, where do I start with this? Because you've embraced a lot of our key messaging, and it's great that you've brought it to life. But it's it's your own version. And I think you're really on the right track to certainly fitting in with with my belief about the development of young players. 
So I've, I've already got to commend you for that. When we were looking at skillful players, there are so many different versions of, of skill acquisition. So we really went down one particular route. And what we found was that the basis of a lot of skillful actions and skillful decisions can be traced back to the player having a mastery over the ball. So if you want creativity, you want the player focusing and being able to concentrate on all the different possibilities. You don't want them wondering where the ball is or you know, um, what kind of touch so they have on the ball. We need to make that automatic so that we can release more cognitive space for the, for the decisions and for the kids to consider what are the possibilities for me in this situation. And unfortunately, if you've got a very narrow technical base, that narrows down all your options and all your possibilities because there are only a few things that you can do. And we want to keep that wide open for as long as possible. So if we build kids with a real mastery over the ball, it opens up so many more possibilities when they're playing the game. They're not confined or restricted by their own ability because we've made their own ability massive. And we want kids thinking, well, in this situation, because of what I can do with the ball, I could do that. I could do this. That's a possibility. I could use that. So that's the kind of environment that we want to create because it opens up all of these possibilities. So we'll have a little look how we gain that mastery of the ball later on. If you want to be creative with the ball, our belief is that you have to be creative with your body. And yet we've got lots and lots of people who think football is an early specialization sport. So what they do with the kids is lots and lots of football. And in some cases, it's absolutely appropriate. In some instances, it's actually not appropriate. So the returns are going to be reduced anyway. But if, the, if we're talking about these opportunities, what we want to give the kids is lots of different activities that develop their physical literacy. And football is great at developing certain aspects of physical literacy. But there are other sports, other activities, and other things that we can provide for the children in the foundation phase that will actually do a slightly better job than football will in preparing them for the demands of football later on. So we've, we've still got an eye on the prize. We know what we're trying to prepare them for, but we may not use football all the time when the children are this young. But we do know that it's perfect preparation for when they specialize later on. And I think that's one of the messages we're really trying to get out um, to, to the coaches at all levels. That not all the answers lie in football, particularly around physical literacy and, and that physical development. So we've got mastering the ball, mastering the body. And I've got a short video here. Um, it's, it's looking at ball mastery and it, it might just open up a discussion or some questions later on. So I'll just play that now. I'm hoping it, it works. <laughs> So in, in no way am I endorsing Chinese and its um, human rights activities. Please don't think that. 
But when we've looked at um, when we've looked at skill development, we wanted to we wanted to consider well, what is skill, and is is the kind of ball mastery there skillful? So if you wanted to unmute and just contribute, we could we could just possibly begin to unpick that. So is what you saw skillful? I think sorry, Pete. I think it was a, a, a foundation skill level for the younger younger kids. Uh, and I suppose the next question would be, where would they take that skill to? I suppose how would how would they progress it if it was sports related to to basketball? I suppose now, obviously, these kids were, you know, five, six, or seven. Yeah, I think a couple of couple of things stood out for me. I think what the children demonstrated was a, a real control and mastery of the ball. Whether they could use that control and mastery skillfully, as soon as you start introducing any elements of decision making is another thing. But if you had to look at the kids and thinking in basketball, could they bounce it, control it and do whatever they wanted to with the ball, I think they're on the way, they're on their way. But if we look at skill as being done when there are decisions to be made or when there are opponents present or when there are situations to evaluate and then make a decision, that mastery would allow you to spend more time thinking about those things rather than about, I, I still can't bounce the ball properly. So, if you are doing loads of kickups with kids, it's not necessarily skillful. They are developing a mastery over the ball, but it's not, it doesn't mean that they are operating skillfully. The skill really begins to come when they are elements of decision making involved and choices have to be made, possibilities have to be weighed up, and then the right technical actions have to be performed. That skill, that, what you've just seen there, is more about mastery over the ball that will allow you to release more space within your brain to make the right decisions. Because if all of that's, that cognitive space is taken up with wondering whether you can bounce the ball effectively, you've got less chance of making the right decisions. Can you see where we're going with that one? So <clears throat> what about... Um, a game at Wembley, um, Stephen Gerrard was passed the ball in a big game that England had to win. I think it was against West Germany. Sven, Jung, uh, Sven Eriksson was the manager and one of England's finest midfield players miscontrolled the ball. Yeah. Um, I think the reason for raising it is that Gerrard, I know, could do everything, but it wasn't it wasn't the mastery, it was his ability under pressure. Exactly. And that I think is what's also, what makes football so interesting is that there's so many elements that go into producing um, high quality players, but, but none of those Chinese uh, children, um, whilst they, they were getting that natural rhythm and touch, yeah. there was no pressure and who would determine uh, who would be the most skillful when they were under pressure? It may not be the same children. It, it, it's a great point, and, I, and I'm glad you've made it, because there is always a context. So you might think you've got excellent technique, and that, that is the beginning of beginning. Uh, it's the beginning of mastering the ball. But for you to display that, there is always a context. And those contexts can be less pressurized, more pressurized, or very intense or not very intense. And I think that has an impact upon your ability, your thought processes, and the decisions that you make. So part of the opportunities, remember those three things, skillful players, opportunities, some of those have to be pressurized so that we can challenge your technique and your skillfulness 
that's emerging under pressure. And sometimes that's controlled pressure. Sometimes it's at a tournament where you know you won't have control over the pressure and it could get out of control, but you need to see how the players react. And particularly, you need to see how they can operate skillfully within that pressure cauldron situation. And, and I think that's, that's where, in our three categories, in that opportunities one, we've got all, well, we, we want to consider all of the things that you, that you actually said, that pressure is such a, an important factor. But it's a, it's a great point. So that brings us on to our decision making. And the model we've adopted, um, because there are a number, it, it really looks at the game in this way. The, the game of football is a very random, unpredictable, chaotic game. Because if, if I do something with the ball, or my teammates change positions, or my opponents do something, that constantly changes the game. And it constantly changes the opportunities that are uh, available. And so we need players who are flexible and adaptable and can really um, exist and flourish within a game that's constantly changing. And I think that's our starting point for operating skillfully. They are able to see the possibilities that present themselves in a constantly changing game. And they've got such a high level of technical ability and physical ability that it allows them to succeed in this ever-changing landscape within the game. And I think that's how we want to try to develop coaches who can then go on to develop players. But it is the most difficult thing to come to terms with because you're almost trying to come to terms with something that looks almost unmanageable. And I think that's why we adopt formations and systems to try to make some kind of sense of the unpredictability and the chaotic nature of the game. But this is what we're preparing players for at the highest level. And so their technical ability, their physical ability, and their decision-making ability has got to be of the highest quality. And for us, the starting point is mastery over the ball and your body. And over a much longer period of time, we are constantly challenging their decision-making. And because, because the game can change in a heartbeat, sometimes you haven't got time to plan your next technical action. Sometimes you have to act in the moment or instinctively or with a gut feeling and you, you just almost do something. That, those are the players that get a sense and a feel for the game and are able to operate in that way. Because if you have to think for two, three, four seconds before each technical action, you're not going to be great at football because the game won't allow you that kind of time. So, let's, let's look at an example. Let's look at an example about what are the possibilities in a game of 2v1. So, when I was, when I was much younger, I'd have run this practice by saying, um, I'm giving you the area, I'm setting up the numbers, and tonight we're going to play 2v1 because I want the two players to practice the 1-2 wall pass. Is that okay? So this is the setup. This is the construct. This is what I want you to think about doing. So what the players will do in looking for the 1-2, they will ignore all of the possibilities. Because as a coach, I've said, Let's, let's see if we can dominate in this situation by playing wall passes. There is nothing wrong with operating in that way. But because we are challenging players to look at all of the possibilities 
that occur in a 2v1, I would now frame it differently. I would probably say something like, we've got an end line to the left and an end line to the right. I want you two players to, to think about how you can achieve that objective of getting to one line, turn around and get to the other as many times as possible. So what I'm doing, instead of narrowing off the possibilities by saying, I want us to look and practice the, the one, two wall pass, I'm saying, I want you to notice every possibility. Can you see the subtle difference? I ran this with a, a, a top academy in London and all I saw was one way to operate in this. And the, the, the priority that the players chose at under 11s was they just passed the ball to each other. And they passed the ball quite quickly. It was almost as though the ball was a hot potato. So they only chose one way of all the possibilities that were there in this game. So I asked, I gave the coaches a sheet of paper. It was laminated and at the top it had, we're going to play 2v1 bingo. And I want you to watch the players and every time you see them do one of the things on your sheet of paper, I want you to cross it off. And when you've crossed them all off, shout bingo. And they were only able to cross one thing off. And that was that side foot pass to your teammates. So what they'd done was they'd ignored all of these possibilities. Because in a 2v1, all of these things are possible. And in a game of football, we want players thinking, I could do that. I could stay on the ball just to see and move my opponent and make it easier for my teammate. I could, I could play a, a 2v1 uh, a wall pass. I could draw the defender towards me to give my teammate more space. So that when I do get the ball to him, he can receive in more space and he's got more time to think. We could cross over and, and fake and take and do all those quick switches of the ball. You could change your mind at the last moment. And instead of doing it, you could trick the defender or you could add disguise to all of your movements. Now, if we go back, what we want to communicate to coaches is this, this is not just for a 2v1. This is for every possible situation that you could create. 2v2s, 3v2s, 4v2s, whatever. What we want the players to do is explore the possible solutions to the problems that the practices or the games present. Rather than lock them in by things like, it's 2v1, I want you to practice the wall pass. It's 2v1, but we're going to play off one and two touches. In doing that, what, you, what you're doing is reducing all the possibilities that we want the players to explore. Does that, can you see where I'm coming from? I would rather players play this game knowing that all of these things are possible. All I'm doing is setting an overall objective, get the ball to that line, then turn around and get the ball over this line or score a goal there and then score a goal at the other end. So I'm not, restricting, narrowing off, or limiting any of the possibilities. That's the kind of player that is going to be successful at international level because in the blink of an eye, they can suddenly spot a different possibility because somebody's moved, a gap's opened up, space has appeared somewhere else, but they're open to it because they've been through a development program that has allowed them to explore more possibilities. And this is, I think if we can get coaches to adopt this kind of methodology, it just opens up so many more options for the players, but they're gonna have to really need high levels of technical ability in order to, to do this. 
And I think that starts with our work in the foundation phase. I'm happy to take some questions on that at the end. I'm almost at the end. What we want the coaches under this, this banner of inspirational opportunities, we want coaches not just to randomly select their, their practices or the formats that they play in training and games. What we want them to understand is that if you play 1v1, these are the returns. And some players will need those returns. And so in your planning, those are the guys that play 1v1. We want coaches to understand what returns you get from 2v2, from 3v2, from 4v2, from 4v4, all the possible permutations. For the coaches in England, we are going to provide what the possible returns are for each format. And then we want them to look at it and say, I've got some players who need more of this. So we need to play this format because we, the, the returns are likely to be greater in that format than if we did something else. And we want coaches to, during their planning, to look at what the players need and then try to match that with an appropriate format, practice design or uh, numbers so that the players are challenged appropriately. So we want to become a lot more sophisticated in the knowing the returns from different formats or different practice types in training and games. We also want to communicate that if this skills journey is too fast and you move very quickly from 5v5 through to 9v9, you may miss out huge chunks of understanding. During the lockdown, we've been communicating with the Brazilian Federation and virtually all of their coaches, football coaches, were futsal coaches first. And in futsal, what the coaches had to come to terms with were small overloads, small matched up situations, small underloads. So they became experts at coaching in 1v2s, 3v2s, 2v2 situations. And then they, if when they converted to football, even though there were more players on the pitch, they still knew how to help the players understand where 2v2s, 3v2s, 2v1s occurred within the 11v11 game. And so their understanding of the building blocks of the game was so much deeper than the coaches in our country. And the development that the coaches had playing futsal, because the game changes so quickly, and it is a game based very um, much on overloads and underloads and exploiting those, they were able to take all that knowledge and understanding into the smaller formats of football and in, into the bigger ones as the players went through the process. And the players' support and guidance from the coaches was so much more detailed because they knew the game in so much more detail and at a, a much deeper level. We want to start assessing coaches on our qualifications to see whether they can help players sort out a 2v1 or a 2v2 or a 3v2. So if our plans are accepted, if you're doing a qualification in England, certainly one of your first qualifications, you'll be assessed on your ability to coach in a small number practice, like a 2v1 or a 2v2, because we need coaches to develop this kind of understanding because they are the building blocks of the game. And that's how we aim, fingers crossed, to develop more skillful players. So I think that's my last slide. I'm now open to, you know, unpick anything that we've, we've talked about. I'm happy to be challenged, because as I said, there are, there are other ways to develop skill, but we've chosen a particular approach based on the experts that we've spoken to, 
but also trying to combine it with our beliefs as well. So um, it's not perfect yet, but we're hoping it's going to make a real impact if we can get this to the whole game. So thanks for listening. That was uh, fantastic, uh, Pete. I'm going to open up. There's a question that's come through in the Zoom. I'll just pick up straight away, and it's from Joe, and he's got a... Uh, it's just on your little uh, two, two for you wind diagram. Would you ask them to find a different solution each time they turn and try to reach the end zone? Um, what you find is when players are developing their skill set and developing their techniques, what they tend to go back to are the same solutions which then makes them predictable. So actually saying um, you've got the timing of that one, you've got the disguise of, of that one really well, is there any other things that you can do? But challenging them to come up with a different one each time might be too much too soon. But what you're looking for over a period of time, because your observational skills are developing as well, you are noticing that they have a default and they tend to just use this one solution. So if that was the case, I'd be saying to the players, what if that wasn't on? What else have you got? But if you've got players limited by their technical ability and their mastery over the ball, they tend to choose the same things to do anyway. And if they're successful, that's brilliant. But as soon as they move up the levels and meet different challenges and the game changes and your opponents change, that's when your repertoire has to be a lot bigger. And so you, you have to have more solutions to the problems that are, are going to occur. But it's a great question. Has that answered it? I'm shouting out. I think it has, yes. <laughs> I think it has. I'm just going to ask you one regarding uh, <clears throat> up here and the, the sort of, sort of uh, Scottish FA format. Uh, the under the 2013s will play fun fours, and then each age group will move up to the fun fives, and then three years uh, seven asides, and then primary seven that will be tw uh, eleven. They'll, they'll play nine asides, so they play the little games usually on a, a sort of Sunday. Morning, we're very much encouraging the coaches not to coach the kids and let them play. And sometimes it can also be a little bit frustrating with the coaches when they say, Well, if they're seeing the same kids maybe making the, the same errors or mistakes, uh, you know, we find that a little bit frustrating. So I'm just trying to get your input. Uh, where from our point of view, we're trying to let the kids really play and enjoy the game and give them maybe a little bit of guidance. But if you've, if you've seen the same thing open and open, what would you say to the coaches? Uh, to give them a little bit of support. <clears throat> um, what if I've if I've understood it correctly? We're talking about how we manage mistakes, really. Yeah, yeah. It's during the little uh, game situation where they're, they're playing games and yeah, making little mistakes. Yeah. Maybe they're taking the ball from the goalkeeper and you know trying to pass into midfield and losing it three or four times. Again, coming from the sort of club, coming from the SFA directive, which we fully support. It's limited coaching, let them play, let them learn their own mistakes. But the same okay. token is maybe we want to give them a little bit of guidance. And it's just, you know, it's a fine line. Well, yeah. you see some coaches in a sort of Sunday morning where they're, you know, they're walking the, the sidelines. I think we've all, all seen it before and they're just constant, you know, instructing the, the kitchies, kitchies. Yeah, this could be a very long answer because I want, I want to tackle it in two ways. The, the first way is this, with a mistake, I'm always watching the players. And I'm looking to say, is what they've just done a one-off? So is it something that, you know, they rarely do and they've just made a mistake? And that happens. I watched some Champions League football last night and there, was, there were mistakes all over the place. So why should we, you know, have a real downer on kids who are they're still learning about the game? So is it a one-off? And if it is, I can pretty much ignore it. If it's, a, if it's a trend, the alarm bells are beginning to ring because in this situation, the player is making a very similar decision and at the moment, it's not coming off. It's not working. So either I'm going to challenge them for them to think about doing something different or this is where I can help and say, well, if you're struggling, try this. So we've got a one-off. We've got a habit. Uh, sorry, a trend. The last one is, is it a habit? 
And in this situation, they constantly do the same thing and it's not working. Part of my role is to decide which one of those it is, because if it's a habit, that's going to be really difficult to break because I'm actually I'm I'm asking for a permanent change in behavior in something that's maybe quite deeply ingrained. So that's the first part. One off trend or habit. Let's establish that first. The second part in the answer to this question is I would be looking at what's happening and saying, how well have I prepared the player in those situations? And I'll look back at the, the coaching that we've done, the, the small number of practices, the information I've given the player, because we may not have covered it at all. And we certainly may not have had the kind of levels of practice that's going to influence those changes in behavior. So I would look at myself first and say, is this a result of a part of their development that I, I might have just missed over, uh, or missed out or skimmed over? And again, mental note that in training the week after, I need to come up with the practice that is going to give this, this player some realistic opportunities to be in those situations just so that we can we can have some um, player coach time to try and overcome the, the, the problem. So that's how I would begin to do it. Just shouting on is not going to change anything. Yep. A long answer, but was that all right? Is that... that that was spot on? Hopefully I've taken that. I'm just going to open this out to the, the coaching floor now. So just take yourself off mute and shout out or feeling that you can put yourself onto the chat so we've got 15 minutes left so I think there should be a fantastic time to quiz Pete so please shout out or stick a wee question onto the chat function Pete can I can I just ask you mentioned you'd been in discussion with Brazilian coaches and futsal which I think would be brilliant here what what sort of age level do they start to move the kids up to the larger format games because we're obviously we're we're 2011 is our kids, so they're mm -hmm. nine, ten years old, and they're in their first year of sevens. Uh, just going back to the decision making and the creativity, those types of individuals tend not to stand out so much when they're thrown onto a bigger pitch. I don't think at this age, yeah. And it's easy for them to get disillusioned. And I think you know the the type of kids that do do well when you move up to those those bigger pitches potentially not going to be the ones that can make all those decisions and are the technical players. So it was yeah. just really a, a sort of double question. What, what age do you think it, it, would move a, up? Yeah, it's a great question. I can tell you what happens in Brazil. Um, the, we, we visited um, Corinthians in, in Sao Paulo. So we spent some time with them. Up until um, 16 years of age, the players follow a dual pathway. So on a Saturday, they'll play futsal competitively right through to 16. On the Sunday, they'll play football. So that dual pathway goes right the way through with the players. And then and around 15, 16, the, the coaches are having discussions with the players saying, we think you're going to play for Corinthians at futsal because they've got a professional futsal team. Or actually, fut futsal's been great for you, but your future now lies in football. But up until that point, they've had a dual pathway. And the administration and the leagues and everything else is structured so that they can have a dual pathway. So they, they don't clash fixtures. They know that Saturday is a futsal for the footballers. And they know that Sunday is football for the guys who play futsal. And it, it works really well for them. What's happening in Brazil is the type of creative players that they used to produce is reducing now because the kids are not playing out in the streets. They're, they're not doing what they were doing, you know, um, two or three decades ago. So they're suffering from that same lack of creativity and imagination because um, the opportunities are being reduced. So just including futsal or cage football or street football or 3v3 is another alternative that is going to give you, as a footballer, something you, you might not get.
from the 11 aside game. But what it gives you is going to help you when you play the 11 aside game. I would really be in favour of holding back 11 aside until at least 14, because then you get more players who've gone through puberty. You, you see their bodies developing and then they now need the bigger game. But when you go through puberty, because your limbs are growing and your body is changing so rapidly, that's why you have to revisit all the skill acquisition, smaller formats, you have to revisit them again in order for you to play the big game effectively. So there's lots of reasons why we should consider, you know, when the, the, the formats change and is there a way that we can combine formats and hold players back until that 11 v 11 game that we know is on the horizon. And to be fair, all the kids want to play the 11 v 11 game, you know, but we need to ensure that they, we give them the necessary skills and abilities to do that effectively. Another long answer. Sorry about that. No, it's great. Thank you. Anybody else? Give me an easy ride. Pete, I've, I've, got I've, got you've sort of answered that anyway, I was going I've to say a question. Oh, brilliant. Right, Roger. Go on, Roger. So, um, there's lots been written about um, what it takes to master um, playing the cello or being a great tennis player. And I guess it, um, what I'm focusing on here is practice. And I just wonder what your thought is in terms of indeed almost repetitive uh, practice, you know, doing Cruyff turns, step overs, um, and making sure that those individual touches, where you put your feet, you know, all the, the architecture of these moves is yeah. really understood. Um, or are you going to say, well, we want to play street football. It's great. It's the fabulous way to learn. That's how the kids in Scotland learn. Get on. We'll help you. We'll give you one or two little tips. Um, next week, we'll play a different game of street football. You'll learn. And hey, presto, in five years' time, we've got uh, the next uh, <coughs> Jimmy Johnston. I'm trying to be provocative deliberately, but is there a place for boring old farts like me that actually think that actually practicing one thing, not for the whole session by any stretch of the imagination, but practicing one thing at the end of 10 minutes, you can actually see that everyone in your group can now do the Cruyff turn. Isn't that important? And how do you balance that with what is a wonderful philosophy and give me some great insights this evening, Peter? Yeah, it's um, you're not an old fart. Um, I think what you're what you um, what you've outlined is one um, one skill acquisition theory, in that you build up what they call motor programs, and it's almost um, a neural pattern that you associate with a technical action. And so you can deepen that neural architecture to give you, it's almost like the best version of a side foot pass between two players standing 10 yards apart. So you're looking for an ideal version of that. Unfortunately, the game isn't like that. And that 10 yard space can change. I could be off balance. I could be resisting an opponent. The, my contact on the ball might not be as secure as it, as it always is. Somebody could be getting in the way and I have to change my mind at the last moment. So what I'm trying to say is for young players, if we adopt a, a skill acquisition approach that gets the kids to just practice one ideal version of a pass or a turn, it may not be preparing them for all the different nuances that are going to crop yep. up in the game. I think, uh, in fact, uh, this question comes up a lot. If you are spending, if you have an hour a week and you're spending 10 or 15 minutes on that kind of practice, I'm saying give the kids to do that at home. And when they come to you, you help them unpick the game and make sense of the game. 
that repetitive kind of practice can be done away from you, away from the club, and they bring that extra practice and that extra technique back to the, your practices so that you can help them make sense of the game. That's how I would prefer it. If you're in an academy, and some of our academies in the UK, in the England have the kids for six hours a week, then if you've got that much time, I think you can spend a small amount of that developing a particular technique. But it would be about, if it was a long range pass and really finding those sweet spots, it would be about putting backspin on the ball. It would be about putting fade on the ball. It's that kind of stuff, not the repetition of one ideal version of a long pass. Because you want to say, in this situation, what are the opportunities? I could pass to him, but I'm going to need backspin. I'm, I could pass to him, but I'm going to need some fade. I'm going to... I'll, there's an opportunity to pass to this guy, but I need this kind of pass. I've almost got to punch it in. That's the kind of variety and richness that we want all of our players to be able to do so that it opens up all these different possibilities. We can't restrict the possibilities because we haven't, the players haven't got the capabilities. We, we've missed those opportunities. Is that okay, Roger? It makes a lot of sense if you've got players of a certain level, perhaps, but it was what you said at the very end. You, you can't restrict them because they haven't got the, the possibilities. Yeah. And the cap the cap that they, you can't restrict them because they haven't got the capabilities. Yeah. That, that makes it a conundrum. Yeah. And my Cruyff turn should be done in response to the actions of a defender. Mm -hmm. And that defender will defend differently so an ideal version of the Cruyff turn is, for me, is only a starting point. The mechanics are there. The use of my arm, the disguise, the, the, the way I shape my body, that's there. The, the real success and disguise and the surprise in doing it will come in my ability to just subtly change it depending upon the situation that I find myself in. That's the, that's the ultimate that we want to try to get to. But what you describe is part of that process because you have to go through the mechanics first before you can offer any kind of disguise. So, yeah. Thanks, Roger. Great question. Thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> Somebody's asked about the utopia of patient learning coaches. <clears throat> If you want to work in the foundation phase, you need a, an absolute barrel load of patience, kindness, and willingness to care for people because that's the bottom line. If you haven't got those things, the foundation phase might not be for you. So if you've got a short fuse or you, know, you, you can't be patient or you don't understand that what we're asking the kids to do is really difficult, then you need to either work in a, an older age group or you need to wash the car on a Sunday morning or you need to go and play golf, but don't coach in the foundation phase. <laughs> it comes with the territory, I'm afraid. But if, if there was maybe two, I'm going to say two, if there was maybe two or three takeaways that you're going to say to the, the coaches tonight to take away, what would it be? Um, <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> we, we've decided we want to go after skillful players. So if at Spartans you want to prioritise certain things, do your due diligence, develop your programme in the way that you, you, you are, and then unpick and work back as to exactly what you need to implement for, in order for you to achieve your objectives. If we want skillful players, but the opportunities we provide for them are so narrow, then we're not going to produce skillful players. So all of the things that I think we've spoken about go hand in hand. And I think what you've got at Spartans, uh, Stuart, you've got a really solid base from which to work from. You've got virtually all of the things in place. It's just developing those coaches now who are really curious 
about the next bit and the fine detail and how can we get better at developing what is already a really good uh, program. Anybody else? Carlo? Quick question, Peter, just very oh, quick. Oh. Shall I go Les and then... How do we get the... Sorry, sorry. Les, we'll go to Les and then we'll go to Carlo next. Okay, cheers. Okay. Here, quick question. It's, it's just really, how do we get the balance between the prescriptive learning and, and, and the free learning? How do we get that balance right? <clears throat> um, I, I teach at a university in Birmingham on a, an early years program. Um, and we have, we have a phrase about pedagogy and teaching and learning. And what we don't want to do is hijack the learning. So if you allow children to explore, what you are looking for are opportunities where you can extend the learning. But it's based upon their curiosity and where they've taken the learning. I think if we work in a particular way in football, we can begin to explore with the children and with the young players what the possibilities are so that we engender that sense of curiosity and creativity. And we have a phrase that if we want to extend the learning, all we're doing is that the child is borrowing some of our knowledge to make sense of something. And then they, that pushes them into the next phase of their own learning and curiosity. So if, you're, if you feel as though you're being too prescriptive, you're not lending your knowledge, you're dominating and hijacking the child's knowledge. So they're never going to develop that kind of curiosity for themselves. Whereas if you lend them something, a piece of knowledge that is going to help them in this situation, and then it's going to open up a lot, of, lot more possibilities, that's a much nicer analogy than hijacking it and dominating it and taking it over completely. We know what kind of player is that's going to produce and it's not the kinds that we want. So lend them bits of knowledge to help them solve problems if they can't solve it for themselves, but give them an opportunity to try to solve the problems themselves. And then you're looking for the right time and the right little bit of information that will kick them on to the next bit of learning. Okay, cheers, Peter. It's kind of like going back to the old, I think having that, um, the, the core skill, if you like, and then within that, being able to allow those that have got the, 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 the player or the capability to go on and we can extend that, and then and those that are struggling with it, just trying to get them to the core level. Yeah. Okay, if, um, if, you, if you're very prescriptive or you dominate the decision-making, at best, the, the player is only ever going to be as good as you are. So unless you've won the World Cup or the, you know, the, the European Championships, the, the players are never going to get there because we need them to think differently. And we can just, we, we really just support that process. And we, we like to, to see it growing within the players because if we're any good as a coach, we should see the player go way past our capabilities, but it should be through the way that we've worked with them. And we've played a really important part, even though they've outstripped our knowledge, they've outstripped our capability, but we've allowed that to happen and we've supported it and we've encouraged it. Okay, cheers, Peter. Thank you. Thanks, Les. Carlo? Yeah, it was just to, just to fully support everything that... that that Peter said, I, just going back to 2v1s, one of the things that I was maybe going to interject with is that uh, it may be quite important just to show them the options um, uh, in three or fours, perhaps, at various training sessions and then say, right, these are the options, you've ran through them. Now, choose the ones that best situ situation because it's the, it's the chimpanzee and the typewriter thing, isn't it? You can give a wee boy, you know, a ball and give him 40 years and they'll become a better player. You show them once, and if he buys into it, they can become a better player within seconds. Yeah, I, I very much prescribe to this idea of you know showing them and and uh, giving them a variety of options, and then allowing them, but as you say, not to allow them to repeat the same errors over and over again. I don't want to go on too much about this, but this goes back almost to your your, your little seven-a-side team talk. You judge a player by 
what you said to them at the beginning. If you say to them, today I want you to make, um, you know, two cuts onto your left-hand side, and he does that, that's a victory. <coughs> yeah. Um, uh, so you judge them by uh, what you've asked them to do. So that's really just comments, really just to support what you said. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get my message to send, so I got, I, I wrote, I like the four phases without an A of development. Um, then I discovered I couldn't, I couldn't actually spell unconscious, so <laughs> so I don't know if you guys have heard these things, but something from what Nickel, which I thought is very good, I don't know if you've heard these, Peter, it's the unconsciously incompetent two little boys standing side by side, and they're both rubbish, Yeah, and they don't, and they don't know it. You don't know, you can't do it, yeah. Absolutely, then you go on to the consciously incompetent, you know, I become pretty good, and Peter, you're still pretty rubbish, so, you know, I'm now, I'm now, uh, um, conscious that you know you're, you're conscious that you're incompetent then we both become a bit better so we're both consciously competent and then I go on to fulfill my potential and I become unconsciously competent and I'm playing for Barcelona and you're playing for Beacon City so um yeah. and I and I like the way that's put together and I think that's uh, so I think you've come across that before no yeah thanks thanks for sharing it is a really good way of looking at it and that that um unconscious incompetent phase is really important because if you're playing 2v1 and you think the only way to be successful in this situation is a side foot pass to my teammate you're missing out all of the other possibilities yeah and your point about occasionally it, it goes back to the point i made to les occasionally we want to lend them some of our knowledge yeah kick them on to the next phase so I will actually say, did you know that this is also possible? Yeah, uh, Not absolutely, yeah, because they take a long, long time to learn just by trial and error. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you rely on trial and error as your only method, you better be very patient because it could take forever for things to change. And I, I think it, it's never black and white. It's never only this or only that with our coaching interventions, with our practice design, with our all of the things associated with coaching, it's always on a continuum. And the best coaches know where to pitch it on that continuum. So they hit the sweet spot with their approach, with their practice, with their information, they hit the sweet spot all the time. But what they're doing is constantly working up and down this continuum to try to get it right more often than not. Well, great, great observations, and thanks for sharing that. Folks, it's five past, so I think we've, we've kept Pete long enough. It's been fantastic. So I think we'll finish off with two last questions, please. So if you get in quick, you might get one of them. Anybody? I've got one. Are you hopeful for the future? Are we ever going to have these players, Pete? Um... <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it, it's never it's never as simple as if you do this, you're going to get that. It, it's far more complex than that. But I, I think we've for 18 months, Carolyn, we've we have gone round the houses, up and down the mountains. We've we've looked at as much as we possibly can, so that when we do communicate our key messages, we know that it's based on some really sound things. And I think that's that's probably the best that we can do. Um, and I think we're at a point now where we're becoming really confident that if coaches consider this and implement it, it could begin to make even more of an impact. I think the DNA has. It's gained a lot of traction. We're getting a lot of coaches who are you know working with it. But I think there's even more to come. So hopefully exciting times. Fantastic. Anyone for the last question then? Very, very quickly, Peter, thank you for your session tonight. You mentioned earlier um, about the returns from formats that was going to be communicated to coaches in England uh, at some point in the future. I just wondered how we might go about getting our hands on that north of the border as well. Um, it, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, I mean, I'm obviously linked with uh, Stuart and Carolyn at the club. Um, as soon as we produce anything, I'm... I'm happy to share it with anybody. And it, it sounds a bit it sounds a bit counterintuitive that we want coaches to 
help players understand all of the possibilities and yet we're giving you all the possibilities there will always be things that we haven't thought about but what we want to do is just open coaches eyes to say in this format these things might be possible so try to draw bring that to the players attention and try to get them to recognize this one or that one and that gets them focusing on things other than the ball because they're then looking for the possibilities in in whatever situation that they're in but regarding sharing it that's that's not a problem Thank you. jump in my last question uh, to the coaches, obviously, you know, 90% of the coaches at uh, Spartans and a lot of the grassroots clubs over the world, the world wide are volunteers with limited time. We've got a good uh, organisation, the SFA, you know, doing uh, coach education. But uh, again, one other thing you can say to the coaches to help on their personal development, whether it be, you know, social media, books, you know, uh, player development, SFA, but give them one bit of advice to help on their development. I've, I've got a, a massive piece of advice and, and this could upset some people because the grassroots game exists on volunteers. But just because you're a volunteer does not give you the right to do it badly. So we've, if you want to, if you want to be involved, you, you almost, there's a demand that you have to be better than you are. So that, and it's, it's, it's so that, the players can benefit from you getting better. The game has changed from what certainly when I played 30 years ago, the game has changed. So I can't apply the same things that I used to do in training and my coaches then used to tell me the game has changed. So we all have to constantly learn new things, but that's a great role model and um, a great picture for the kids. Because if we're constantly learning, the, the, the thing, is, the message we're sending out to the players is, and we want you to be constantly learning and growing and getting better as well. So for, for me, volunteers do a brilliant job, but it doesn't give you license to do it badly. We've all got to be as good as we can be. Fantastic. So I just want to thank you on behalf of Spartans. I thought the presentation and, and your chat, we could have probably kept you here for another hour. We do want to take up too much of your time, hopefully in a not too distant future. We'll perhaps get you back on uh, again to do some other presentation. But I've certainly got five or six takeaways, maybe things we can maybe look at for the club as well. And I think I've seen some of the coaches scribbling down as well. So Fantastic. A big thank you again from the club and just thank you for the volunteers as well for joining tonight. Hopefully you all took some takeaways. We're getting it recorded so in the, in probably next week, Carolyn, will get that chopped and we'll share that out as well. So just to say thank you again to everybody.